RT is sitting down with Professor Johan Galtun, an internationally recognized founder of Peace Studies, an author of more than 150 books. His most recent book is titled The Fall of the U.S. Empire and Then What? Professor Galtun, thank you very much for sitting down with RT today. My pleasure. In 2000, you had predicted and forecasted that the United States would fall apart, would crumble in 2025. And then after former uh, U.S. President George W. Bush stepped into office, you shaved five years off. You said in 2020, uh, the U.S. empire will come crumbling down. That leaves nine years, according to your prediction. What will happen between now and 2020 to make the U.S. come apart? They will slowly stop making wars after having not been very successful. They will withdraw their bases, like the English did once east of Suez, the 850 of them, according to some count. They will discover negotiation instead of arms twisting and threatening. They will discover dialogue instead of assuming that the U.S. always has the answer. And I think the most difficult one, they may discover equitable trade trade for mutual and equal benefit. That is not enough for a good trade agreement that willing buyer meets willing seller and signs something. You have to look at the effects down in the pyramids that they are on top of. Mm -hmm. And those pyramids may also imply, uh, imply quite a lot of Americans who may be suffering. In other words, a kind of new economic outlook, more towards equity. What do you believe will happen that will cause U.S. leaders to decide to end the ongoing wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and to withdraw their bases. Iraq is not at all turning out the way they hoped, certainly not Afghanistan either. Same will happen in Yemen and Somalia and a number of other countries where they now have undercover operations. Mm -hmm. Somebody will come to the conclusion that enough is enough. That conclusion may not be drawn publicly, but it will be a kind of pullback maneuver that will take place. So that's very concrete, and the basis will be gradually built down, and uh, it will be said for economic reasons. Somebody will say that, and it may be that that somebody will be a more isolationist president. One who would say, we are appointed by God to bring peace to the world under the U.S. mantle. But it looks like the world is not quite up to it. So why don't we withdraw to our own quarters and live alone with our God? In that case, we don't need those spaces. But a very strong defense of the homeland. That would not be an unreasonable way of thinking. So that would be one typical scenario. You say that the U.S. operates under several different contradictions. Many different contradictions. Precisely. I have a list of 15. Can you name one or two that, that stand out in your mind most? I mentioned, let us say, between finance economy and real economy. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Between economy and nature, the damage done to nature. And U.S. is still the heaviest producer of climate gases. Mm -hmm. Number two, by far, is European Union, then China comes. Mm -hmm. So, U.S. may not be on the top forever. But that's a contradiction. Military, I mentioned between, let's call it state terrorism and terrorism. Mm -hmm. It's a limit how far you can come bombing and strafing and shooting people from the air and so on. Politically, Latin America doesn't obey. It's not obedient any longer. Mm -hmm. You will find a number of Asian countries that are making questions. And right now what is happening in the Arab world is, of course, exactly according to my line of prediction. It is not only that they are arguing in favor of democracy, and God bless them for that, but they are also arguing against the dictatorship that handed them over to U.S. foreign policy and Israeli foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Israeli, Israel is shaking right now. Washington is afraid of what's happening. What do you think is going to happen within the next five years or so between Israel and Iran? I think the logic for Israel has changed the last weeks after Tunisia. You see, Israel has been running the game according to the prophet Yesaya, chapter 2, 1 to 5, inspired by the Eternal One through King David's Jerusalem. We will make peace between the Bedouin tribes. And when we have done that, they can melt their swords into plowshares. 
and it's usually the last part that is quoted. Now this is geopolitics, you see, and this is exactly what they have tried to do by trying to somehow buy up one way or the other the regimes in the neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. Right now this is challenged. The challenge to Lebanon came before Tunisia. Tunisia was partly inspired by Lebanon. Tunisia then inspires Egypt. From Egypt is now going from one country to the other. Honestly, I think right now Israel has more basic concerns than Iran. Personally, I do not belong to those who think that Iran is making an atomic bomb, but I think they want the world to think that they're doing so. It is another statement. Israel is in deep trouble right now. And there is a deeper trouble that may come. When the U.S. empire goes further down, and it has gone down quite a lot already, then people will start looking for a scapegoat. Could that scapegoat be a tail which is wagging the dog? Mm. You know? So, if you look at the relative size of U.S. and Israel, it's even a relatively small tail and a quite big dog. And the big dog looks sort of bulldogish or pit bull, something of the kind, with a minimum tail. Now, this is disproportionate. There will be the extreme danger of anti-Semitism in the US, trying to find a scapegoat. And down that line could come, since you said within five years, could come the point in time where people in the US says, say Israel is a liability. We demand of Israel a change. When you saw U.S. President Barack Obama campaigning two years ago, um, and when you saw him win the presidential election, did you think he was going to hmm. change America in any way? I didn't believe him. Or did you think the system was too strong well, for one person all, to make a difference? Well, first that one is obvious. Secondly, I felt he didn't know foreign politics. I felt he didn't have ideas that the ideas were limited to some promises about Guantanamo, for instance. But Guantanamo is a very limited part of it. It's a human rights broken part of a territory that they still have a lease on in Cuba. So that is not foreign policy. He preached change, and I would like to hear some clear statements about what that would mean. Now, the system is strong, but what of course impressed me more was that the major financer was Goldman Sachs and that American Jews for Obama was an organization in Chicago that stood up at an early point. So I expected him to be very pro-Israel. And that of course came out in his first speech in the Knesset, saying that undivided Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel for eternity. That's what I wanted to hear. So the moment you go on that line, you see, you have tied up a lot of your foreign policy. So right now, there are 22 Arab countries, counting Palestine, starting with Tunisia. You now have six, seven, eight of them, and they're coming by the day in revolt. I think he was mentally unprepared. I think nobody had told him. Then, of course, I would side with those who say that he made a mistake, a very basic political mistake. You cannot leave behind disregarding the people who voted for you. And they were American workers, and women, and blacks, and Hispanics, and youth, and all kinds of groups with enthusiasm hoping for something new to happen. Whereupon he consults the Republicans for every single little thing, and instead of operating by presidential directive, which he could to a much larger extent, try to make a compromise with the Republicans, watering down whatever he proposed, and in addition having them vote against him except when he finally was willing to lower the taxes for the rich, thereby increasing the very high inequality in the U.S. Do you think uh, President Obama will win a second term? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. If he won as a black, maybe the next one will be a woman. Sarah, Sarah Palin. Palin? Don't underestimate Sarah Palin. Is there anything that Americans, everyday Americans, could do between now in 2020 to prevent the f what you call the upcoming fall of the U.S. empire? I don't think that's decided inside the U.S. It's decided outside. Let me just clarify that by one simple sentence. 
what is going to happen to Afghanistan is not decided in Washington. In my view, it's decided on an axis between Istanbul and Beijing. Turkey, Iran, Russia, China. Increasing irrelevance of Washington. How relevant is Washington to Vietnam after they lost the war and pulled out? You see, it's the political defeat that is more important than the military one, the irrelevance. So having said that, the fate of the US empire is decided on the outside. Now the implications of it is decided on the inside. And you're asking what can an average American do? Because what you're saying right now, what you're predicting, it's, it's not very comforting to I know. any American that would be listening I know. to you. I know, making the US less vulnerable. Making the US less vulnerable, pulling yourself together locally, not trying to change Washington. That's a very difficult proposition. Mm -hmm. And maybe the lawmakers are no longer representing you. Maybe there is a cut. Maybe inside the beltway they live their own life. Do it locally. In the 2,500 municipalities in some of the states, have cooperative, small industry, saving banks, kick out the investment banks, boycott them, go for the small banks, have agricultural cooperatives with sales points, making food available, cheaply available, affordable prices. Pull yourself together to make housing that is affordable. All of that can be done by giving jobs to the disadvantaged and lift them up so that they get a little bit of money that could be starting circulating. So as you understand, I am saying instead of 90% bailout, 10% subsidy or stimulus, 1090. Now, I'm not arguing actually in terms of Washington spending, I'm arguing in grassroots initiatives. Mm -hmm. And Americans have an enormous amount of innovative talent. Right now, we don't see much of it. We see some of it in Northern California, some in Vermont, or some other places where it is sprouting. But it's a very good idea for Americans to prepare themselves against the effects of losing the empire. We're going to have to leave it right there, Mr. Gelton. Thank you very much for sitting down with RT. My pleasure indeed. Thank you.